reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The apostles said to the Lord, Increase our faith. The Lord replied, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Who among you would say to your servant, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here immediately and take your place at table? Would he not rather say to him, prepare something for me to eat, put on your apron and wait on me while I I eat and drink. You may eat and drink when I am finished. Is he grateful to that servant because he did what was commanded? So should it be with you. When you have done all you have been commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what we were obliged to do. The Gospel of the Lord. So last week was the gospel of Lazarus and the rich man. And uh, during it, uh, in the homily on that, I, I, I hesitate. It's something I hesitated over. Uh, just to recap the story of Lazarus, the rich man. Remember, uh, the rich man, he dressed in purple garments and died in sumptuously each day. And Lazarus was a poor man lying at his gate, um, yearning to eat the, the scraps that ate, fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores on his body. And then they died, and Lazarus came to the bosom of Abraham, and Abraham went down to the torments of the flames. And so um, and that's how the story went. And then there's a, a crucial moment where the rich man said um, to send Lazarus to warn his brothers so they don't end up in this torment. And how many brothers does the rich man have? How many? Five. Five. Count of five. And the magic number in the Bible is what? Seven. So the rich man and his five brothers, that makes six. Where is the seventh brother? Lazarus. Lazarus. If only the rich man had embraced Lazarus as his brother, he would not end up in torment in the flames. And so, then, and then I added um, last week that, and all this on the website too, you can watch our homily there. Um, I added then that if your brother was lying at your gate, wouldn't you help him? Because that's, what, that's, what that's why we help, because it's like a brother. And then I added, and that's why I hesitated, and, and if your sister was at the border, wouldn't you help them? And I went on to say, you know, if, if you had a, a, a family member in need of medical care, wouldn't you help them? Or a, a job, wouldn't you pull connections to help them get a, a job with the living wage? Or a decent school or, or a decent housing, do everything you could to help family members? And that, that's what families do. We are a brother's keeper. And so that's what I said. But I hesitated because I, I know um, immigration is a hot button and I can miss the mark. And I like to be liked. I don't seek con conflict, you know, but I think the, the gospel was really pushing to say these words to us today, that brotherhood, that sisterhood, that family, that God wants us to live in the kingdom of God. So I hesitate. The second reading for the gospel for today, Paul has words that really spoke to me. Paul writing to Timothy, could have been writing to me, Paul saying to Timothy from jail, Paul's in jail yet again, <laughs> and he's like an old man writing to Timothy from jail, like an old campaigner to young Timothy saying, you know, keep the faith, keep it going, you know, this is the message, you must keep going, you know, he's not apologized for anything he's said and done while he's in jail again, soon to be executed. No, Paul's saying, you know, keep it going, and he says, in fact, he says to Timothy, uh, for God did not give you a spirit of cowardice, in other words, he's saying to Timothy, don't be a wimp. <laughs> Speak the message. When we were confirmed, and some of you were confirmed uh, a long time ago, you might have remembered, when the bishop laid his hands on you to receive the Holy Spirit, then what did he do? He slapped you. <laughs> he slapped you on the cheek. Because you are now a soldier for Christ. 
You are a soldier for Christ, and this is strengthening you, you receiving the Spirit, to now uh, to, to speak up and to serve Christ and follow Him as a soldier of Christ. The same Spirit that will pray over this water and that Gabriel will be baptized in. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same Spirit that came upon the apostles at Pentecost. That is the same Spirit we have received through baptism and confirmation. Paul is saying to us, not just Timothy, you were not given the spirit of cowardice. Don't be a wimp. When it comes to the gospel, don't be a wimp. And the gospel is good. It's so good. You know, Paul's in jail, not because he's told people, do good, avoid evil. Or he, he told people, work hard and be a good citizen. That's not what he told people. He proclaimed, Christ is risen. Christ is Lord. And that's what we proclaim too. I may have told you this story some time ago, but uh, once I met this, um, this woman, uh, she's coming back to the church and she uh, has had had an abortion years and years ago and finally coming back to church, finally able to, to voice that. And she had, um, was a, a beautiful person, but also numb, just like no expression on her face and it kind of just shut down something had died in her. And so I invited her to pray, to, to picture, first of all, what this looked like, what her life looked like. And she pictured herself in a dark room uh, covered with trash. A dark, dark room covered in trash, just sitting there. And then I invited her now to invite the Lord to notice this with her, to see what happened. And she noticed uh, a knock on the door. And, and she went and opened it, found a way through the dark room the, and the trash and the floor, opened the door, and there was Jesus. And Jesus didn't yell at her like, you shouldn't have done that. You're a bad person. Not at all. The Lord Jesus said to her was, I'll help you clean it up. <laughs> and, and from that moment on, she cried tears, probably the first time in 20 years. And she began to smile. And over the weeks and months ahead and next, she became, uh, came to church regularly. She uh, was adopted by the widows of the parish. They just unconditional love on her. And she just blossomed. And it came to life, resurrected, because our Lord, I hope you clean it up. And this is the message we proclaim, that he came to take away the sins of the world. He came to give us life, that we are dead to sin, but to bring us back to life with his love. This is the message we proclaim. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a uh, commitment Sunday where we renew our commitment to our parish vision. Here and now, our commitment to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in this parish, in this place. We must speak up so people like her and others know this good news. Abby Johnson is a woman um, who is had to, in college, she began to volunteer for uh, Planned Parenthood. And then she eventually began to work with them, um, where they, they do abortions. She was in, working in their office staff, worked her way up to be a, a director of a Planned Parenthood clinic. And she, along the way, she had uh, two abortions herself. She got divorced and remarried, had a child. And so life was good. Um, but th she was troubled by the work of Planned Parenthood in abortions. And it came to a head when um, she was called into an examination where she saw an ultrasound. She had to be in the room for some reason and saw this ultrasound of this child um, that was, um, and then she saw, you know, this live image of this fetus, this baby, unborn, and then she saw um, the probe that was touching it and the child reacting, and then she saw the suction. And that's when I closed the book. I mean, I could not read anymore. <laughs> Horrific. But she wrote a book called Unplanned. It became a movie. She speaks 
about this again and again, and she's not afraid. She is not a wimp to speak about this. Particularly this month is Respect Life Month, where we honor life from conception to death that God has given us, made in his image. Life is precious. And when we mess up, yes, there is mercy. But we must protect it and speak up with courage for the gospel. I googled um, leading cause of the death in the United States. And I saw what I expected I saw, that there's heart disease, um, like 650,000 people died in heart disease in one year, uh, cancer, about 600,000, and then other things like accidents and so on. But you know, the, the number one cause of death in our country? Abortion. Over 850,000 babies unborn each year, heart stopped and the mother's heart broken. The leading cause of death, totally preventable, not even mentioned in our country. 60 million since 1973. There is some good news. The number of abortions per year gone down. There are only 850,000 a year. It used to be over a million. The rate of abortion has gone down to about one in five, which is good news. Um, however, among African Americans, half of pregnancies end in abortion. Half. Again, horrific. Horrific. Abby Johnson and many others speak up that life is precious. We must respect all life that God has given us. This is the good news, the good news we bring to the world. Now, when we speak up, we simply tell our story, like Abby Johnson is doing. We tell what God has done for us, how he's brought us to life, how we, we know his love. Tell that story. Tell that story. People desperate to hear it. We don't tell it as so many other things are said these days with, with character assassinations and personal attacks, you know, more concerned about winning than about truth. No, we tell the story with love. We speak the truth with love. Our bishops tell us we must form our conscience when we talk about church teaching. We just don't remember what we, we, we learned in second grade for First Communion? No, we must read what our bishops say. And they say strong things, that marriage is between one man and one woman. It's a lifelong faithful union. They have strong things to say about sex to our culture, that is holy, is precious, and it belongs to be protected within marriage. They also have strong things to say about the economy. The measure of economy is not how much wealth it produces, but how much it helps those who are least, and its people before prophets. They have things to say about climate change, about immigration. They have things to say about the, 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 the business of the world, but not in reaction and not, not in, in ranting, but with love. They speak the truth. And as Christians and Catholics, it's our duty to form our conscience, to know what our bishops are teaching, so we can speak this too. And in forming our conscience, our bishops tell us we must also fast and pray so that we are effective witnesses. St. Paul said to Timothy, you were not given a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. Self-control? How'd that get on the list? But yes, we must be masters of our own desires. So we're not seeking to win or to hurt, but seeking to love. That's the spirit we've been given. For me, it comes down to this. When I hesitate, you know, discerning is this a, you know, the virtue of prudence or is this fear? It comes down to this, you know, studying and learning and praying and fasting, all that's there, but also asking myself this question. Can I live with myself? Can I live with myself if I do say this or don't say this? A year from now, what do I wish I had said? Can I live with myself? Because that's what the conscious is asking us. You know, to live in the truth. You too have been given through baptism and confirmation not a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. We need it. 
So we're in a fight, a fight for our lives, a fight for the life of children and elderly and the poor, a fight for people who have lost hope, a fight for the life of the world. And the good news is, it's a fight that Christ has already won through the victory of his cross. Now tell the story and don't be a wimp. <laughs>